Good evening, everyone. Um, uh, welcome uh, to uh, our program, uh, which we're going to be talking about uh, the vanishing trial. Um, to lead us off, um, I want to introduce Molly Gill from FAM, uh, the organization that's primarily responsible for this film. Molly? Thanks for having me here tonight. I'm so excited that so many people have signed up to see this new documentary film from FAM. Uh, FAM is a nonpartisan organization in Washington, D.C. We are almost 30 years old. And uh, one of the things that we do best in our work for sentencing and prison reform around the nation is telling stories of people. And over the last 30 years, we have heard so many stories of what is known as the trial penalty. So many stories of people exercising their constitutional right to go to a trial, to have a jury of their peers decide the case, and then being faced with an exponentially longer sentence for the very simple reason that they refused to plead guilty for whatever reason. Perhaps they believed they were innocent. Perhaps they uh, simply wanted to uh, you know, test the facts of their case in an open courtroom like our founding fathers uh, gave us the right to do. And they find that they lose more and more years and even decades of their lives. And to us, these are always uh, tragic stories. And we wanted to uh, show these stories uh, to throw some light onto this issue because I think most Americans uh, watch TV and Law and & Order and they think, oh, everyone goes to trial and you have this dramatic courtroom battle and um, maybe justice prevails in the end and maybe it doesn't. And the reality now is that uh, television is one of the only places you can watch uh, a criminal trial these days because 98% of cases in most jurisdictions are ending in guilty pleas and the trial penalty is one of the reasons for that. So, um, we're so I'm so pleased to be here with Norm from NACDL who has done uh, just a ground groundbreaking report on this issue and brought this to light. And I wanted to say a note too before I introduce our panelists about the stories that you saw in the film. We uh, are well aware at FAM, um, and I think the whole country is aware in this moment of how serious and significant the racial disparities are in our criminal justice system. And we're seeing lots of responses right now to try to address that, and we're supportive of those efforts. Um, in the story, we in, in the film, we really wanted to show lots of different kinds of stories and people that are being impacted by the trial penalty, uh, knowing full well that uh, communities of color are disproportionately impacted in negative ways by our criminal justice system. But we wanted to show that this is a problem that is impacting all kinds of people from all walks of life. And so you see in our movie, we have a, a story of a, a white collar offense. We have a gun offense. We have several drug offenses, men, women, white, black, people all across this country of all different kinds of backgrounds in all different kinds of communities are experiencing the trial penalty. So it's a very serious and significant problem and we hope this film will begin to shed light on it so that we can all work together to fix it. So thank you so much for watching the film and I'm gonna jump into introducing our very qualified panelists who are with us tonight. Uh, first, we have Robert Rose III. He's a New York City advocate for criminal justice reform and has a personal experience with the trial penalty in New York that he'll share. Jared Trujillo is one of our panelists with us tonight. He's a New York City public defender with the Legal Aid Society, and he's the president of the Association of Legal Aid Attorneys. Susan Walsh is with us this evening and is a partner at Vladek, Raskin and Clark with over 20 years in trial and appellate experience. And Susan chairs the New York State Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers Trial Penalty Task Force. And of course, we have Khalil Cumberbatch. He's the chief strategist for New Yorkers United for Justice, who is also a host of this screening tonight. Uh, that NYUJ is a coalition of broad and diverse organizations and their goal is to pass criminal justice reform legislation in New York State. So uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Norm so he can jump in and we can hear from uh, these wonderful panelists we have tonight. Thanks very much, uh, Molly. I appreciate that. And I appreciate all of FAM's work on this. Um, uh, so I'm Norman Reamer. I'm here actually in my capacity as the uh, chair of the board of New Yorkers United for Justice. Uh, which, uh, as Molly just mentioned, uh, Khalil is our chief strategist, and we've been working uh, 
for the last two years to advocate for common sense reforms to transform the criminal justice system. I'm also sort of here as the executive director of NACDL, uh, which has been working on the trial penalty uh, problem uh, for a number of years and is one of uh, our signature objectives is to do something about that. So I wanna welcome all of you who are watching from around the country, uh, say good evening to those of you in the East, good afternoon to those of you who are, uh, who are in the West. Uh, and um, I hope you all had a chance to view the vanishing trial. Um, it will be uh, released more generally in the, in the next few weeks, uh, but we hope you had a chance to view it uh, during these past few days. The, the film is intended to focus attention on what we think is one of the most insidious and pervasive defects in the American criminal legal system at this time, and that is the trial penalty. Uh, that, refer, that, that, that phrase refers to a systematic way in which accused persons, presumptively innocent people, are induced to waive valuable rights to avoid the hammer of a trial penalty. We think it is a key contributor to mass criminalization and mass incarceration. It provides the levers that insulates the government, that insulates government overreach and police misconduct, effectively institutionalizing racial and ethnic bias, which so totally infects the criminal legal system in this country. The fact is, uh, as Molly said, 98% um, of cases are not tried. Uh, trials are becoming extinct. They are, as the title of the film suggests, vanishing. Um, and I will say not only that we have established on the federal level, it's over 97% of cases are resolved without a trial. There are actually some places in this country where no cases, no criminal cases go to trial at all. But what's, what's even worse is it's not just trial rights that are given up, it's many other fundamental constitutional rights as well. All because we created a system in which the threat, the threat of a geometrically increased penalty is used at every stage of a criminal proceeding to coerce accused persons into surrendering fundamental rights. It's actually ironic that to put a human face on the dimension of this problem, we've profiled four individuals who actually went to trial. It's ironic because the real problem, of course, it's, it's a horrendous problem for those people who get hammered with the, with, the, with the trial penalty, but the real problem is that so few people actually can go to trial because of the trial penalty. Of the four people that we've, uh, that we've profiled, they, they are all people who did not yield to that pressure and coercion, and three of them have paid a tremendous and cruel, cruel uh, price. Uh, Eric Wyant was offered three years and because of a mandatory minimum after he was convicted following trial, was sentenced to 20 years. Chris Young was offered between 12 and 14 years because they enhanced his sentence with two minor prior convictions uh, for possession of drugs or for, for drug-related for drug, uh, for drug crimes, very small amounts. Uh, he was, because he went to trial, they enhanced his sentence and he was given a life sentence. Uh, Sandra Avery, uh, the, the, her more culpable husband was, assert, was sentenced to 17 years. She went to trial. She was given life. Uh, fortunately, she received a clemency from the Obama administration. So she's home. Eric and Chris are still uh, in prison. And Kevin Ring, although he avoided the worst of it, um, it shows you the enormous intense pressure that's brought to bear. Uh, and the only reason he avoided the worst of it is because a judge had a measure of discretion, which is something we were going to talk about as potential uh, solutions. Um, before I turn to the panel, um, I note that the film uh, was in some measures inspired uh, by the report that Molly referred to that NACDL produced. Um, it's a report called The Sixth Amendment Right to Trial on the Verge of Extinction and How to Solve It. Um, Jessica, if you could put that one slide up. Um, and in addition to that report, which we're gonna give you a link so that anyone can go and see it, um, there is a special double issue of the Federal Sentencing Reporter uh, that was published that, with about 15 or 20 uh, authors, uh, all uh, writing on the trial penalty. And I, I strongly urge people to take a look at it. These authors represent the left, the right, and the middle of the political spectrum in this country. Uh, they represent people from the academic world, practitioners, affected individuals. 
it is the one hopeful thing that I want to launch this discussion with is that there is so much consensus coming around this issue uh, from all different perspectives that the, the, the leverage that we have given uh, to force these uh, surrender, this, this massive surrender of rights uh, has to be rolled back. So with that, I want to uh, thank our panelists. They've already been introduced and I want to get right in uh, to the discussion. Uh, and I want to start with you, Khalil. From, from your perspective, uh, how common is the trial penalty in New York State? Thanks, Norm. And uh, thank you, Molly and Sam and NACDL for the amazing work that you've done in being able to uh, tell the unfortunate story of the four individuals that are highlighted in the vanishing trial. Um, unfortunately, Norm, we see uh, as formerly incarcerated people, as advocates who are working to dramatically change the criminal justice or criminal legal system here in New York State, we see all too often uh, people uh, taking pleas uh, because they don't want to be overly uh, uh, punished simply because, uh, as you mentioned, they are exec they're executing their constitutional right. Uh, as you mentioned, there are some places uh, in, there's some states in this country where uh, there are unfortunately an extremely high number of cases getting resolved uh, through, through plea, uh, but there are some local uh, municipalities where that is all too often the lay of the land, where for you to be able to execute your right to go to trial not only means the potential of you getting a, uh, a, a higher sentence, but also means that you could potentially languish in the system much longer. Uh, you know, most of the uh, systems that we're talking about, uh, there is the ability, uh, depending on charge, uh, to go to trial within a year or two. But there are some municipalities across this country and in the state of New York, where unfortunately you could languish for five, six, seven years in a pretrial phase. And so the combination of that, the combination of the threat of being punished more simply because you want to go to trial, simply because you want to face the evidence that is against you, and the fact that you could languish in a jail system uh, that is all too often uh, not healthy for many different reasons. Uh, many people are taking uh, plea deals, unfortunately, because of those combined circumstances. Now, you, you've had your own experience with this, um, and I, if, you, if you don't mind, I would like you to share with everyone um, the experience that you had and how the trial penalty came into play. Um, and uh, and we talk a little bit more in detail about how um, uh, the fact that you didn't have to waive certain rights actually worked to your benefit. Yeah, sure. Um, I uh, uh, served six and a half years in the New York State prison system. Um, I um, uh, uh, took a plea deal uh, because of the factors that we just laid out. One, I didn't want to uh, um, go to trial and uh, have to potentially face a higher sentence simply because, uh, because I executed my constitutional right. The judge that I had in my, uh, the original judge that I had in my case uh, was one who had a reputation for being overly punitive, even in plea arrangements, uh, let alone in trial penalty. And so I definitely wanted to avoid that. Um, and uh, I took a plea. Uh, uh, and uh, ended up serving four years of that original sentence. My original plea uh, was, um, uh, the initial plea that I was offered was 15 years. Eventually, uh, we were able to get it down to 11, but that was as someone who had uh, no prior uh, um, convictions in the criminal justice system. And yet, and still, I was given 11 years on my first offense. Uh, fast forward four years, uh, I was able to uh, have my uh, conviction overturned uh, because I was granted entry into the highest court in New York State, but that was only because the um, I did not have the ability to appeal my conviction taken away, and uh, and as uh, as ironic as that sounds, uh, being that I just uh, uh, criticized my first sentencing judge, the reality is that for whatever reason, in, through the plea proceedings, uh, that right wasn't taken away from me, and because of that right, I was able to appeal my conviction, and although I pleaded guilty. Uh, there was a, a, a procedural matter uh, that, uh, that was highlighted that actually overturned a lot of cases in New York State where individual was not properly informed of the, uh, the full breadth of the sentence that they were taking, meaning I was uh, uh, sentenced to 11 years in prison, but I was also sentenced to five years on post-release supervision. And so I was not taking an 11-year plea deal, I was taking a 16-year 
plea deal. And that wasn't effectively explained to me uh, at plea proceedings. And so my conviction was overturned. But again, it's only because I had the ability to maintain the right to appeal my conviction, uh, although that conviction came through a plea deal. Right. And I'll, I'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this. Um, it's very common in most places around the country uh, uh, to require as part of a plea uh, agreement that an individual waive their appellate rights. But what's interesting also about your case, Leo, when you did get sent back, um, uh, as you know, anyone who knows your biography knows, you had done amazing things during the four years that uh, between the between the uh, original sentence and and the resentencing. And why don't you tell everybody what happened uh, when you went back for this resentencing? What did yeah. the DA ask for, and what did you end up getting? Yeah, sure. So uh, just like most of the cases uh, that were benefiting from this uh, procedural uh, matter that led to overturned convictions, uh, many people, when they went back down to court, unfortunately, the uh, district attorneys were just essentially offering you the same deal just with whatever the post release was added on. And so I was uh, similarly uh, uh, offered the same thing. When I went down to court, my first offer was 11 years with a five years post release supervision. Uh, but a, as you mentioned, Norm, I was uh, uh, I was uh, the, on the beneficial receiving end of uh, being at a facility, uh, Greenhaven Correctional Facility here in New York State, that had a tremendous amount of programs that were designed and facilitated and implemented by men who were incarcerated for men who were incarcerated. Uh, and I benefited tremendously from those programs. And also within that four years, I was also able to have access to uh, a year of collegiate level work. Now, I will say, uh, and I, I, I am uh, cautiously highlighting that uh, because although those experiences completely transformed who I was as an individual, the reality is that I could have been given access to those same opportunities uh, outside of prison. I could have been given an opportunity to go to college while, uh, uh, um, while my case was in a pretrial phase. And so I don't want to make it seem as if prison saved my life, but the reality is that had I not had access to these programs, uh, similar programs exist uh, uh, outside of prison, uh, I wouldn't have had the track record that I had that ultimately my appeal uh, lawyer uh, was able to present to the sentencing judge who I had at that time. Now, as I mentioned, it was four years since the time I was convicted to the time I had served and been back down to court. Um, and that uh, original sentencing judge had retired. So I had a second judge who surprisingly was a judge. He was fair and impartial. He said, you know, uh, uh, my lawyer said, look, this individual has been incarcerated four years. Uh, and if this individual was in free society for four years, you would have had to take into consideration all of the things that he was able to do in those four years. And I'm asking you to do the same. And the judge said, you know what, you're right, I actually will do that. And uh, my lawyer worked diligently to pull together a 100 plus page report and submitted it to the court. And it was through the prompting of the judge that actually I was able to get a lesser sentence. The district attorney, unfortunately, uh, didn't want to budge on what the plea uh, 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 deal was going to be. And so ultimately, Abe was able to get a uh, eight-year prison sentence with two and a half years of post-release supervision. But that's also because the uh, judge at the time had taken into consideration all of the things that I had done during that first four years of my incarceration. So to some extent, at least the judge in your case on the resentencing acted as a safety valve uh, to uh, use uh, at least a, a persuasive authority on the DA to give you um, a, a lesser sentence, taking into account that all that you had done. Um, but as I mentioned, um, that's, it's, it's rare uh, that you don't have to waive your right to appeal in order to uh, get the benefit of it. So I'd like to turn to Jared now, and I've got a series of questions for you about how things operate in, in New York. Um, but First of all, what's your experience with appeal waivers? Um, do you see them? Uh, we do, um, and they're incredibly common. Um, and almost every judge uh, requires them. Um, not every judge, but it's pretty frequent uh, that judges will require them uh, before someone can take any type of plea. So the plea process in and of itself is incredibly coercive as people saw through the movie. Uh, but when you add that extra layer of uh, going through this coercive process and not really having any way to address it, it just, it, it really just removes, um, you know, really any validity, um, I'd say to the, to the legal system, to the criminal legal system. And, and is, in your experience, is the trial penalty limited to just felony cases or do you see it in other kinds of cases as well? like misdemeanors? Not at all. Misdemeanors, violations, all of it. 
Um, I, I think the thing that people like need to remember is that the people that are being processed through court, the people that you know are, are being put through this this really horrific experience, um, are people. And so um, whether you know whether it happens with the violation case or a misdemeanor or a felony, um, it might happen at a different time. Um, you might have more discovery depending on what type of case it is, but uh, the trial penalty is very real uh, through, for really every human that interacts with the criminal legal system. Well, you know, and, and it's, it's interesting that you talk about how pervasive it is with all kinds of cases. Um, uh, one of the reforms uh, that came through in the last year or so, uh, which I'm very proud to say NYUJ supported was some discovery reform. Uh, but I know that for a long time, uh, in New York, people were actually offered uh, pleas uh, at arraignment or very early on in the case and basically told that if they didn't take it, the offer would go up. Is that still something that you're seeing? So I don't practice anymore, but um, I do know that at least in some boroughs, that still is an issue. Yeah, well, that to me seems like one of the most, uh, uh, particularly for, uh, for people who are of limited means, uh, who may have jobs and families that are critically, they depend on them. Uh, and the idea that you should have to give up your rights uh, in order to get home uh, or not have to come back to court repeatedly seems to me to be fundamentally uh, unfair and flawed. Is that your take on it as well? It is. And, and again, it, uh, just bringing everyone back to the fact that the people that are going through this are real people. Um, you know, going to court in and of itself can be really a, an incredibly traumatic experience. Oftentimes you're the most hated person in the courtroom. Uh, so often our clients are possibly the only black or brown people um, in the courtroom. Um, it can be just an incredibly dehumanizing experience. And to have to have, you know, uh, speaking as a defense attorney, to try to have a full conversation with someone about, you know, what everything means, to talk to them about what are the potential immigration consequences, um, you know, uh, giving them the Sophie's choice of, if you take this plea, you might not lose your job, um, but you know, that everything is up in the air. The, the fact that people could be parents and there could be um, consequences as far as the child welfare system goes. Uh, the criminal legal system is more than just putting people in cages. That's obviously a very big part of it, but it's a lot more than that. And there are a lot of different consequences that could, that could ultimately result uh, from, uh, from any case uh, from a violation all the way up to a felony. And so uh, to try to ask someone to process, um, to, to process the real penalties that uh, could come from taking a plea or from uh, just being there um, in the first place um, without really giving them any discovery, um, it, it's incredibly coercive and it really just leads to a lot of people ultimately waiving a, a right that's incredibly precious. Now, I know that uh, uh, you and uh, the Legal Aid Society represent people uh, in all different kinds of situations, uh, including juveniles. Now, we haven't looked at this in the juvenile context, but is there something about that that we ought to know about? Absolutely. I, I think um, juveniles are two different ways. Uh, one, uh, for kids that are for people under, uh, under 19, uh, that are involved in the criminal legal system, being able to get a youthful offender adjudication um, could be life-changing as far as really limiting the impact of collateral consequences on them for really the rest of their lives. Um, sometimes judges will um, use, um, or prosecutors will use uh, the potentiality of a YO adjudication to coerce a plea from people, which mm -hmm. is, um, above everything else, it, it's just, it's incredibly coercive. Um, it's unfair. And quite frankly, to, to, to threaten to take away a child's future um, if they don't plea is just one of the most pernicious things that really happens in, in criminal court. But it's a problem in, in juvenile court too, you know? Um, and people think that, uh, you know, a, a juvenile delinquency proceeding because it happens in family court. Um, because it's not technically, it's not a, a, a criminal uh, disposition, but it's a juvenile adjudication. People think that it's, it's not as dire, but there are real consequences that can occur uh, from, um, from even having that juvenile delinquency adjudication. If you wanna join the military, if you wanna be a police officer, even if you wanna be an attorney, 
um, to try to change the system later. Uh, those can have real consequences. And um, there, there is certainly a lot of coercion um, that happens there as well. And, and, and are the judges involved in that as well? Yeah, uh, the thing with state court, whether it's uh, criminal court, whether it's Supreme Court um, or even family court, is that judges are, are very involved um, in the plea process, much more so than they are at the federal level. And have you had experience as, uh, as I had when I was practicing where uh, judges, uh, after somebody went to trial, even, you know, even where they had discretion, they would go on the high end because somebody uh, had turned down a plea offer? Absolutely. And, and you know, it's, I, I think, you know, with everything that we're talking about now, it's just there's just this idea that every single person that goes to court is guilty of what police officers are accusing them of being guilty of. So, so many of those judges, they just, it, it's almost as if they're annoyed that someone is trying to exercise their, their you know, constitutionally ordained rights uh, to an actual trial. So really, like, that's just so much of the, the, the philosophy around um, why, you know, the, the trial penalty is really enacted. Um, and you see it at all levels. Um, yeah, it, it's just incredibly pernicious. And it's, it's, um, it's really disgusting. And you're we're certainly getting to the to the nub of some of these problems, and uh, I, I want to. I'm going to. I'm going to move on to the uh, uh, to Robert uh, in just a moment. Uh, but I do want to mention to everyone who's watching that you can send questions in. Uh, we're going to get to them uh, in, a, in a in a little while. We we definitely want to hear from you and get you uh, and get your thoughts in and and, and and get you involved in the conversation. Um, uh, Robert, uh, as I lead this uh, up to asking you a, a few questions. I want to just let everybody know that I, I, I got to know about uh, Robert's situation uh, because uh, NACL and FAM uh, have a state clemency project that we're doing here in New York. Uh, and he was one of the clients who was represented through that project. Now he did not get, um, he did not get clemency. Uh, the governor hasn't been uh, giving too many of those out, although we did see one, a couple, we saw three of them, one of them from our project uh, a week or so ago. Um, but he did get paroled. Uh, Robert was recently paroled. And so, um, uh, first of all, welcome home, Robert. And I want to begin uh, by asking you um, uh, what you were serving time for. Well, I was serving time for a murder in the second degree and from a case in Queens County. And why don't you just tell everybody the circumstances that led to you being arrested, charged? I uh, was... Uh... I was arrested as a result of uh, causing the death of a person that assaulted my mother earlier in the day. Um, he had assaulted her, caused her some serious physical injuries, and I wasn't at home at the time. But when I returned home, I found this person at the house on the stoop with a gun, and I was able to take the gun from him. And when I believed he was going to attack me again, I fired the weapon several times, causing his death. And um, uh, what did you do the next day? Uh, the next day I went to the local precinct. I uh, turned myself and gave a statement as to what happened. And from that point, it was, I got arrested obviously and uh, went through arraignment, the normal process here in uh, New York. And I was about a month later released to bail and I remained on bail for about three years. So hang on for one second. So they. They actually allowed you to be released on on uh, on a bail that you were you, you and your family were able to afford, even though you were facing a, a, a homicide charge. Uh, yes, uh, some of the local politicians in the community and neighbors uh, wrote letters to the judge. Uh, some of the people from the school that I was attending at the time wrote letters to the judge as well and the DA. And as a result of that, uh, the judge at the time let me go on bail, and I had an uncle that was able to help me get bailed out. And he did so, and I was released. And by the way, what was your what was your criminal history before that incident? Uh, this was the first my first contact with law enforcement. And so, how long did you uh, did you wait till you got to go to trial? I believe it was about three years. From I got arrested in July of 1992, and I uh, the sentenced in June of 1995. And those three years, did you get arrested for anything else? No, I had no other contact with the law enforcement. 
So uh, this was the basically the only time you've ever had contact with law enforcement was when you confronted this uh, individual armed who had, had uh, injured your, your mother. Um, you obviously uh, went to trial, but before you went to trial, what, what if any offers did they make to you? Uh, initially, I was before a, a very punitive judge in Queens that a lot of people are afraid of, it was named Leahy. And he initially offered uh, five to 15 years. That was the original uh, plea offer. And then once the trial began and the testimony from the uh, DA was completed, the, they had a conference with the judge and defense lawyer at the time. And then the plea went from five to 15 to three to nine years. And uh, so you were facing a possibility of having to go to prison for three to nine years. Um, you had no history, no, cr no criminal history at all. Uh, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I, I assume you felt that you had a good case uh, for self-defense uh, based on the fear and the, and the circumstances that you were in when it happened. Is that, a, is that about right? Well, based upon most of the stuff from uh, some like the other lawyers that were at the uh, courthouse when we went for uh, appearances, most of them told me that Judge Leahy was a very strict judge, very hard judge. And if he allowed me to be out and gave me a chance to get myself together, I had a good chance at being uh, uh, found not guilty. And so that was based upon some of the lawyers that were in the well of the court from day to day, as well as my trial attorney. So that's was well, the process. Well, I guess uh, it's obviously based on what we said at the beginning, you were convicted uh, and what were you sentenced to after the trial? Uh, after the trial, I was sentenced to 25 years to life. So I was given a life term after going to trial in uh, the jury. And do you know uh, what the mandatory minimum would have been? At that time, the mandatory minimum would have been uh, 15 years to life. And I received 25 years to life. So not only did you not get the minimum, but the judge went and gave you the maximum actually that she could or he could give you at that time. Yes, well, I had switched Judge Leahy was no longer there. I was before Judge Corrado in Queens and she gave me, I guess it was eight times more than the plea that she eight offered times. a few weeks before. So it was mm -hmm. kind of uh, harsh. Well, it's, uh, it's harsh is not the word for it. Shocking, uh, revolting, distressing. Um, before I move on, I'm going to ask uh, I'm going to ask Susan uh, some questions as a follow up to what happened to you. Um, uh, just I'd, I think it's I'd like everybody to know uh, what work you've done uh, since. By the way, how long did you serve of that sentence? Uh, I served 24 and a half years. I was released this past October as a result of uh, they have a program in prison where if you do certain programs, you can get six months earned off your sentence, and I was the benefit of the six months, I got the six months off and I was released six months earlier over the time. And, the, and what work have you done since? Uh, since I've gotten out, I've worked with a nonprofit here in New York City called Worth Rises. And I did research on their prison industrial complex report that they put out every year. And it's, we research a couple thousand companies and write about how they profit off of the criminal justice system. So it's a pretty lengthy report and pretty uh, detailed. And and I'm currently working with a city agency now, and uh, that's very new. And it's a temporary job, a one-year contract, so that's what I'm doing now. Tell us what it is that you're doing. So I'm working with the uh, COVID trace teams, helping trace the cases throughout the city and uh, people that test positive for COVID-19. So I operate a computer pretty much, processing names and people's information and to help uh, people trace them and find out their contacts and so on. Well, it's pretty important work, and we thank you for doing that, and, and thank you for sharing your story. Uh, so, Susan, let's consider Robert's case, uh, and uh, I think of the Eric Wayne case in the film. Uh, there, uh, the 20-year mandatory minimum, the judge's hands were tied. Um, still horrible that, you know, a three-year, um, a, a sentence of three years turns into 20. In this case, um, the judge actually piled on way more than was required in Robert's case. And I guess I want to start with you by asking this. If a prosecutor felt that three to nine years, 
And a judge felt that three to nine years was adequate for punishment, for deterrence, for protection of the public. What is the moral or ethical justification for a sentence that's more than eight times greater? There is no moral or ethical justification in my view. And um, unfortunately, Robert's story is not uncommon. Uh, we know from the people in the film, uh, as well as the human beings here before us, that the trial penalty is so enormous that the more common experience for defense lawyers within the last 10 or 15 years is working with people who do everything that they can to avoid the trial. Um, and that is um, everything that's been talked about already from waiving rights, waiving uh, appeals, pleading to get out sooner, um, or pleading to get the case over with so that you don't have to return to court literally dozens of times to defend yourself and, uh, uh, and avail yourself of your Sixth Amendment right. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, I, I've yet to hear any justification. I don't see that there is any moral justification for eight times the penalty, three times the penalty. I have experience in a case that I'm familiar with where there's 15 times the sentence. 15 times because the person went to jail. And this is a, a, a man that um, was required to register um, and was prohibited from registering his address at the local sheriff station. But he was on 24 hour GPS ankle bracelet tracing, reported regularly to his parole officer and everyone knew where he lived. The crime was failing to go to the sheriff station to register his address. He had every reason to believe that everybody knew where he was 24 seven because he was being tracked. And the penalty for that was one to three years. And that's what he was offered. And he said, I want to go to trial. I believe that if I, uh, everyone knew where I was. And he went to trial and the judge gave him, after the, after the prosecutor ratcheted up the penalty, 15 to life, 15 to life from one to three years as the plea offer. So I, I, I don't know what the moral justification could possibly be for something like that. Other, other cases that I'm familiar with also, the clients that I've worked with who are trying to maintain their anonymity, anonymity now and get back into the workforce, get back into uh, life, they absolutely forfeited a viable, defendable case because they were looking at mandatory time behind bars. Mandatory time, five years. A, a, a man with no priors. His case was an accident was completely overcharged. Uh, he was charged as if he had shot someone or stabbed someone. He'd actually scalded somebody in a restaurant with hot food. The man supported two generations, his parents and his three generations, himself, his wife, his children, and his parents. But rather than risk going to trial, rather than making motions to suppress, he was offered probation and he grabbed it. Well, who wouldn't? a viable, triable case from a defense lawyer standpoint. And it's heartbreaking to know that it's possible that he would have been vindicated at the trial. But lose your job, having two, three generations lose their economic support, and go behind bars for five years when the judge had no option if he was convicted. That's an overcharging by the prosecutor, and that's people doing anything they can to avoid a nightmare of the trial penalty. So let me ask you this from a systemic standpoint, um, when we look at how the trial penalty works in, in, in practice, and you've heard it, you know, all, of the, uh, all of the panelists have talked about the thing, the various rights that you have to give up. What's, what, is the, what is the impact of that in general on our system? Um, uh, when uh, people uh, fearing the kind of uh, outcome that you know, somebody like Robert experienced, um, uh, you know, what 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 what's what are we what are, what price are we paying for that as a society? Well, we see it in the streets in recent weeks. Um, people are recognizing um, and um, uh, that how insidious and how systematic all, all of this damage is. It's not just if you're uh, 
uh, you serve an inordinate amount of time in prison, but people are required to waive the right to challenge evidence, to challenge police misconduct. The reason why we have suppression hearings to, to keep bad evidence out or to keep evidence out, pretrial hearings, is to vindicate people's Fourth Amendment rights sometimes, or the Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. Um, when people are, don't understand that they can remain silent and they speak and they shouldn't, and they shouldn't have been, they should have been told, or somebody was searched illegally. There are bad actors and we all know it and we've seen it in the demonstrations of late. There are bad actors um, in law enforcement and the penalty for a bad actor is you exclude the evidence at a pre-trial hearing if you found that there's illegal police misconduct. If you find that there's lying, you find that there was no probable cause for the arrest, or there was no probable cause for the search. But if someone to avoid 15 times, or eight times, or five times the penalty gives up and waives the right, or is forced to waive those rights to avoid that nightmare incarceration, we never have them. We never vet those law enforcement officers in court and challenge their view. And that is a very, very dangerous reality that is systemic. Uh, and uh, we see fewer and fewer cases, not only brought to trial, but also challenged pre-trial. Um, and it should be because there's the opportunity to ferret out bad acts. And it also keeps law enforcement honest. If they're tested under oath through the system by trial or by hearing, that's how you ferret out bad actors and you keep people honest. If they know there is no chance in hell that there's going to be a trial or a hearing, then there's not a lot of incentive to, to, to keep it clean and to tell the truth. There's a, on the contrary, there's a perverse incentive. And uh, th that also exists, um, unfortunately, in, in, with the prosecutors. There's a perverse incentive uh, to, to, and people bring cases that should never be brought, prosecute cases that are too weak. So in, objects will be challenged in court are so remote now, given the penalty. So in essence, there's a sort of a, uh, it sort of uh, uh, creates an incentive uh, for prosecutors to uh, threaten in great enhancements in order to get rid of cases which they know have flaws in them by inducing people through this coercive factor uh, to take pleas. Is that, is that, is that what's, what's operating? And I'll just, I'll direct that to you, Susan, or, or, or to Jared. Yeah, there's no question that that, that, that is what is, that occurs. That occurs on a daily basis. It occurs in New York in the state system. Um, and it occurs in the federal system as well. Um, well, I want I, I want to at this point transition uh, to another uh, discussion, and 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 that's uh, we're seeing the problem through Robert, through Eric's case, through uh, Chris Young's case. We're seeing the problem of people who um, legitimately feel they have a, a case and they want to avail themselves of a fundamental right, uh, and they. Uh, and, and they take advantage of it. But there's a flip side when you have so much coercion um, and people should be able to have a jury of their peers without being geometrically, uh, receive geometrically enhanced punishment simply for taking advantage of that right. Of that, of that right. Um, Jessica, I'm gonna be asking you to uh, play this film in a minute, but I wanna say a few things to, um, uh, Jessica's our tech person who's helping behind the scenes, uh, cause I can't, tee up things like uh, like film clips uh, on these calls. Um, but um, uh, I'm concerned about the, uh, the prospect of so much coercion being in, in, in the system that people who are actually uh, innocent plead guilty. Um, and we're gonna play a clip of an interview with a fellow by the name of Rodney Roberts who pled guilty to a crime that he did not commit as was uh, proved later on by his exoneration through DNA. And I wanna thank the Innocence Project for making the film available. This is a clip that runs about two and a half minutes. And I think it's well worth um, uh, taking a look at. Uh, and then I'm gonna come back to our panelists uh, to comment on it. Yeah, 
my fingerprints and everything, thinking that I was just going to be in, be out, or this is not, you know, simple assault, and I'm gone. So they held me maybe three, four days more. And I'm like, wow, why am I still here? And they were saying, well, you're being transferred to Essex County, to the uh, county jail. I'm like, for this? And something was wrong from the beginning. And they had already um, seemed to have sized me up already. And I met the attorney that was assigned to the case. He was a public defender. Um, I said, what's going on? He said, well, you're being charged with uh, a kidnapping, a sexual assault. Now, at that point, I went ballistic. I'm like, no, you got the wrong person. I'm here for this. I don't know what's, what's going on. You got the wrong guy. When I finally got to the court, this attorney, he came in and told me that the prosecutor office had a plea agreement. I'm like, plea agreement? I didn't even do it. You know, I, took, I pled not guilty. I'm innocent. He was this pressure. And he was like, if you don't take this deal, they only offer you two years. He was home in two years. And if not, you know, they're going to take it off the trial and the judge is ready to give you life sentence if you get found guilty. And I think you're going to get found guilty. And this is my attorney telling me, this is the one person I had to, was there to help me. I, I felt like I was by myself. So I thought that to get home to my son and my family and, and to salvage my life, that the best thing I could do for myself was to plead guilty and fight it once I got home. Or at, at least I would be home in two years and I can fight it from there. <laughs> said they found it. When I turned to me, I knew that I was going to win. I knew I was coming home at some point. That was it. I knew I didn't do it. I just needed the proof to show. And some people plead guilty, not out of, not out of ignorance, but out of fear. I mean, you, you are afraid that you're going to lose the one thing you want is your life. But that's it. You feel like I cannot handle this lifetime or this doing this time for this crime I commit. And if it wasn't for the DNA evidence, thank God, I'll most likely still be sitting in jail. If I didn't have that, if it was just because eyewitness testimony wasn't enough. So if I didn't have that, I would still be sitting in um, prison um, trying to fight for my innocence and my release and prove that. So thank, thank you for queuing that up. And before I turn to you, Jared, for a series of questions about this, I also want to, I mentioned the Federal uh, Sentencing Reporter articles. There's one article in there uh, by a gentleman by the name of Chris Ochoa. It's a firsthand account. Uh, Chris uh, similarly pled guilty uh, to a, um, uh, a rape and murder, uh, which he did not commit because he was being threatened uh, with the death penalty. And uh, his lawyer, his family even, uh, everybody wanted him to save his life and they were afraid of what would happen to him uh, if, he, if, he, if, he didn't, um, if he didn't capitulate. Um, but we're talking about a system that now we have uh, undeniable empirical proof. I think every lawyer has known this. Our panelists have all talked about this, that innocent people uh, plead guilty. So I guess, Jared, my question to you is, you know, what is it in the system uh, that makes it possible for us to uh, extract guilty pleas from innocent people? How, how do we allow that to happen? And what can we possibly do to fix it? I mean, um, the system in, in and of itself is just inherently sick and it's, it's inherently broken. You know, so much of the underpinning of what the current criminal legal system is, is a continuation of slavery. And almost every single person um, that I've ever represented in court, um, they, they can just feel how it, it's just palpable how their humanity is really stripped from them uh, simply by virtue of just going into the courtroom in and of itself. 
Um, it's, it's very easy to sentence someone to a cage for a long period of time if you don't think that they're human in the first place. Um, so again, so many judges, so many prosecutors just assume that any person um, that's being brought into the courtroom is guilty. So, you know, if that person is, you know, if that person is asking for a trial, then they're just wasting the court's time. They're not taking responsibility for what they did. Um, they are somehow morally bankrupt simply by asking for that Sixth Amendment right. So um, how do we fix it? I, I think that we really just have to, um, something that Khalil said earlier is we have to think about how we invest in communities and the fact that you shouldn't have had to have gone through the criminal legal system in order to get access to so many of the programs that you got. Um, I think that we need to really reimagine policing. One of the worst victim in, in, in incarceration, one of the worst victim impact statements that I've ever read um, as an attorney was, it was, this was a juvenile case uh, where my client was 15, uh, two girls in high school got into a fight over a boy, uh, my client uh, busted the other girl's lip. Um, it was an assault three, which is an A misdemeanor in New York. Um, it was a school fight and that was it. And in the victim impact statement, I, I just remember like the, the, uh, the complainant uh, saying, you know, I can't believe that client's name is probably only gonna get probation for this, you know, or if she doesn't get probation, she's only gonna spend, um, you know, probably like less than a few months in jail. And um, it like, just, and luckily that didn't happen. Um, but it's just, people don't realize like a day in jail is a really long time. Like a year of probation is a really long time. I've had people plead and take jail time so they don't have to do probation. Like, I, I just think that we need to really reimagine that depriving someone of their freedom is really extreme. Um, and then just really reimagine the entire criminal legal system from that and try to find different alternatives to, you know, just incarcerating people and losing that people potential and, you know, really depriving someone of their humanity. There's just better things that we can do. And I want to stay with you, Jared. I've got a question uh, from uh, one of the viewers. But uh, before I get to that question, uh, somebody's asked about the, the ability to view the film. So the film is not in general release yet. Uh, it will be in a few weeks, um, but if you uh, contact um, either uh, NACDL or FAM or NYUJ, we will, um, we will send you a link so that you will have it as soon as it becomes available. So the question that I wanted to follow up with you on, uh, Jared, from, from one of the viewers is, well, why don't we just have a law that says that people can't waive their rights? Wouldn't that solve this? I mean, I, first off, how do you enforce that? Um, but, but would that solve this? Probably, probably not. Um, again, the criminal legal system is just so inherently coercive. Um, and, you know, we're talking theoretically about all the coercive factors, uh, that are there, but like, you just have to remember that the people that are going through this are also just really traumatized, uh, from the fact that they might've been in jail for a few days from the fact that, you know, they're going through, um, a really racist, uh, court system. So, um, you know, would that help possibly? But I, I don't think that that would, um, I don't think we can just snap our fingers like that. Um, you know, my, my view has always been that you, you, you can't fix the system piecemeal. You have to fix, you have to fix a lot of things uh, together in order to uh, reinfuse some justice and restore these rights. Um, if you simply said no one can plead guilty, for example, um, you might wind up with a lot more people doing a lot more time. Um, and, you know, so you, you have to look at the at both sides of the equation, but um, I want to stay one, one more minute on, on coercion, and I want to turn to Khalil, um, because I know that you've been work, working with this, uh, you know, the community of people that have been affected by, by our criminal legal system for so long, um, and I want you to comment on a ritual that happens uh, in every court, virtually in every court in the country, every single day, and that is when somebody pleads guilty to a, to a crime as part of a plea ar arrangement, um, they are generally required uh, to do what they call an elocution. They have to uh, basically say that no one has threatened them or coerced them into pleading guilty. And if they say, uh, if they don't agree that no one has threatened them, they say, you know, they say, yeah, I have been threatened or coerced, then the court will not allow them to plead guilty. But it seems to me that when somebody is saying, going through that rote 
recitation that they have not been threatened or coerced, but they're actually uh, in a situation where they're being told you're going to get 15 to life or 20 to life if you don't take this. That is the biggest lie that's ever been told. Am I wrong? Yeah, or the death penalty, right? I or mean, the, right. Uh, yeah, the consequences are they run the gamut. I mean, look, the reality is that, as as Jarrett said, the coercion is deeply built into the entire criminal justice process from the time of police interaction all the way up to conviction and even afterwards. But 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 also hypocrisy is built into it uh, deeply as well. I mean, the and that's just one factor of it. The fact that you could say uh, on the record that no one has coerced you or threatened you in any way, uh, although most of the coercion and threats have been in the courtroom, the reality is that that's just that just highlights one of the uh, uh, underpinnings of the criminal legal system, which is the, which is that hypocrisy is deeply baked into the result that we have. And and we're all some somewhat complicit in this, although it's a it's a it's a unique challenge for the defense attorney who whose ultimate concern is for the welfare of their client. And I can't help but think that you know we're being put in an almost untenable position when you believe in your client, you believe the client has a a a, a credible, reasonable story to tell, and yet you have to tell them that the consequences of taking advantage of the right to to tell that story, to fight their case, uh, could be so uh, so dramatic. So I want to. I have a, another series of questions that I want to bring back to Susan, but I want to go to Robert for one more minute. And I, I just, you know, based on your experience and obviously listening to this discussion, but having lived a quarter of a century um, in a prison, um, most of which was because you took advantage of a constitutional right. Imagine somebody who was in a situation similar to, to the one that you found yourself in. No history, a, 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 a tragic event. Um, no one can know for sure what was going on in a split second in a human mind in that situation. What would, what would you advise someone if, if, some, if, 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 you, if somebody asked you, what would you say to somebody in, with the benefit of hindsight, uh, based with the choice that you had and the outcome that you experienced? Oh, geez. It, it's a difficult choice, you know, when you have this belief in your heart that you are innocent or that you shouldn't be punished for what you've done or just take responsibility. It's kind of hard to tell a person, you know, to plead guilty, but then knowing what I know, th the amount of punishment you could receive, you almost want to tell a guy, hey, listen, you better take a plea because if you don't, the system is, is really rough. They will put you away for a long time and, and your life will be taken away from you. You know, looking back, part of me says, hey, if I would have took a plea, I would have been gone years and years ago and could have moved on with my life. I, it's almost like Khalil mentioned earlier. I wouldn't have to sit in prison and take advantage of the programs there. I could have taken advantage of the programs in the community, you know. Yes, I attended college while in. Yes, I participated in TED Talks while I was in. Those are things I could have did in the community as well. But, you know, it, it just didn't happen. And I would tell people, hey, you got to really think long and hard before you say no to a plea now, because the system just won't allow you to uh, get a fair, fair chance, it, is, it appears to me now. And, and I would thank you so much for uh, being so candid and, and so eloquent. And I would just, uh, the prerogative of the moderator, I would say that a system that puts people in that position is a system that needs to be done away with, uh, because that's not justice, that's not anything close to what was contemplated uh, when these rights were uh, created. Um, but I wanna now turn back to Susan. Uh, I want you to talk a little bit about the work that the New York State Task Force has taken on um, and uh, hear about what you're doing, how you're going about it. Uh, and I know that the work is still a work in progress, but you know what potential solutions there might be. Yes, well, it is still a work in progress, but um, the New York State Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers um, is taking a look by, by trying to garner the input uh, and the experience of people um, that practice in the system uh, to the broadest extent that we can. Um, we have surveyed defense lawyers uh, throughout the state. We've uh, surveyed, attempted to survey all of the prosecutors throughout the state in every county um, and other stakeholders as well to find what their experience is uh, with the trial penalty in their professional uh, lives. Um, 
we're finding um, and, and to try to present um, coherent patterns uh, and a report, uh, much like the trial penalty report that uh, the National Association did, um, what's, what's happening in the courtrooms across the state and what are the causes of it? Um, and what we're looking at fundamentally is how can we reform the system without tossing it entirely um, out, uh, as you just suggested. And some of the things we're seeing is that you know, having a judge involved in a plea negotiations isn't always helpful. It can be as coercive as not having a judge involved. Um, there are concepts of um, that where judges have to move dockets and there and move cases, and uh, there's a pressure within the system in that regard, and that also strips people of some of the humanity uh, on an individual basis. So through interviews, through um, telling stories, much like the film that we just watched, um, and through garner, gathering statistics about what's occurring in the courts, we hope to pre present some reforms. For, for example, legislating a cap on how much higher a person can be sentenced, how much longer a person can be sentenced in comparison in relation to, to um, the plea offer they had before trial. Um, putting some kind of a cap on that. Having um, legislation um, where you take a second look at an individual like Robert or, 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 uh, after they've been in for a while and wait a minute, what are we doing here? Do we really need this person to spend another 20 years in, j in jail when they've taken these courses, rehabilitated themselves, demonstrated that they are um, completely rehabilitated and ready to move back into society. Those kinds of reforms um, is, what, is what the task force is looking at. Um, and also um, educating the public about how important it is that they know about this penalty, that they know how few trials there are, and that participating in, in criminal trials as a juror is as important an exercise of democracy as voting at the polls. Ultimately, society and our citizens have to hold our criminal justice system accountable by partaking in it and participating. And of course, there are barriers to that. Who's in our jury pool? Who can afford to sit on jury pool? Because uh, a person of color sitting next to me that I defend is looking at a 12-person all-white jury from a neighborhood I have never been to or heard of. Um, these kinds of systemic racism within the system, of course, is a reality. But citizen participation in it, um, it and more active participation and enlightenment is the cure. Well, thank you for that. Uh, that's a very comprehensive answer. I mean, to me, it seems like one of the key problems that absolutely has to be addressed uh, is the unilateral control over the over the charging process and then the overlay of mandatory minimums. Uh, I think that we are going to have to tackle that as a society. Um, the second look idea is a great way to get you know to to release some of that abuse. Uh, without doing away with mandatory minimums, but it seems to me that that's it's the interplay between the charging function and the, the manipulation of those mandatory minimums. Now, of course, when you have a judge who gratuitously adds yet another ten years onto something just because they can, uh, that's that's uh, that's a that's a serious problem. Um, but I'd be I'd be curious if anybody uh, wants to unmute and um, and offer any other thoughts that they have as to how we can uh, try to uh, deal with some of these problems. Jared, Khalil, any final thoughts? Robert, I welcome it from you as well, and Susan. Yeah, Norm, um, I'll take a swing. First, just let me say that it is a pleasure and an honor to be on this panel with everyone, but I wanted to say specifically to Robert, welcome home, and congrats on all of the work that you're doing uh, with Work Rises and in the city. And uh, Robert uh, just very nonchalantly said, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, it's a city contract, it's just one year. It's tracing of COVID, which in the midst of a pandemic is probably one of the most important civil service jobs that anyone can take. And although to you, it may just be typing names into a computer, the reality is that you're helping us overcome a, a very deadly disease. So thank you for that. 
Um, and um, what I wanted to say is uh, we all too often think about how to uh, rectify or change the criminal justice system, the one that we're referencing uh, uh, tonight on this panel, but all too often with the lens of the current criminal justice system that we have. And what we really have to do is completely remove that lens and think about how to uh, uh, really embrace some of the other systems that exist that are really truly focused on justice and fairness. I mean, the reality is surprise, surprise. There are other, uh, uh, um, there are other ideologies that exist in terms of accountability, in terms of punishment, in terms of justice that, that, that have existed for centuries before we've created our current criminal justice system. What we're lacking is the political will and just the reality is the, the lack of education for the average Joe and Jane person uh, who, when they view the, when they hear of the criminal justice system, they have all these preconceived notions that are completely false. So what I'm saying is that we have to one uh, talk about how do we reimagine a system that has nothing to do with the current lens of the system that we that we currently have. Two, is that although in the context of of, of what was said tonight, I totally understand uh, all of the panelists saying that the system is broken and that we need to fix it. The reality is that the system is built the way that it's built and it is operating the exact way that it was intended. And uh, we can look at uh, 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 that statement across race, across gender, but the reality is that people of color uh, for as long as we've had the current criminal justice system that we have, have been overly punished have been the ones who have been dragged into the system and all too often are the ones that get the, who, who bear the, the most brunt of its brutality, of its inhumanity and of its straight up and now just deception. Um, and so we really do need to think about how do we have this conversation about a system that operates completely different than the one that we currently have. And, and I'll give you one solid example. When we talk about uh, who the system is operating on behalf, all too often people will say, or the average John Jane will say, well, it's the victim who, who, uh, who, who, this, who this system is operating on, uh, on behalf of. And then secondary, it's, it's, it's on behalf of the people of New York or people of whatever. Uh, but the reality is that if a quote unquote victim, if someone who has received harm, uh, we've heard numerous cases where they're actually the last person that's consulted on what they actually feel true justice is. They're the last person that has any say so in the matter, even if they say, you know what? I don't believe that person needs to be in prison for 25 years. I don't believe that person needs to go to prison at all. As a matter of fact, I don't believe that person needs any punitive nature. They probably just need some counseling, some form of help. The reality is that if we had a system now in place that strictly used the, 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 the want of the person who've received the harm as the North Star, as the starting point, and everything else trickled after that, the reality is that we can't even imagine what that system would look like. And the reality is that the current system we have, as Susan mentioned, the perverse incentives that are currently built into the system that we have won't even allow for that. Uh, at, at, because the reality is the more convictions that prosecutors have uh, is, is the more successful that they're viewed. And so again, we just really need to re imagine uh, a system that is quite different than the one that we have, but also using current, using other alternative uh, 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 processes that exist, that again have existed for centuries, that do deliver accountability, punishment, and justice. Well, I couldn't say it any better than that or any more comprehensively. Um, I mean, uh, I can't help, you know, when you talk about a, a completely different system, Khalil, and I think about how this one operates. I'll bet you any amount of money that the jury uh, that may have convicted uh, Robert had no clue as to what the punishment was going to be. Uh, and uh, you know, the public, you, you're, you're absolutely correct. The public has you know, a, a grave misconception uh, about how you know, severe the system is. Many people in the public uh, don't realize that. Many people in the public do realize it because they've been victimized by it. And uh, one of the things that I've learned of doing clemency work over these last several years is you cannot imagine, one cannot imagine how much of the draconian sentences comes from people being over-policed in certain communities. These, 
these enhancements, these predicate felony, these persistent felony things, they always, always fall on the least, on, on, the, on the people who have the least means and are in the, in the poorest circumstances uh, because that's where the policing resources are going. Um, so uh, I open it up for one final comment from, uh, from Robert, if he wants, or Jared, uh, or um, Susan. Uh, I would like to say thank you for having me here and uh, all the good work that you guys are doing. And I did, I actually benefited from the work and the clemency project, you know, they wrote a pretty good report for me that helped me with parole. Um, and I'm thankful for the work that they've done. And over the years, I knew that I had to take advantage of the programs and opportunities that were available within the prison. So I wouldn't become bitter. I know a lot of times when you serve a long sentence, you become bitter, you become angry at all of the things that you think should have happened in your life. And it was a good thing to have programs available that were positive. Unfortunately, most of the programs were not state ran programs. They were ran by volunteers and community members that came in. And I saw one of the comments tonight was from one of the volunteers that I worked with for many years doing the RTA program. And, and it's good to see people, you know, that genuinely believed in my future, that took time out to come to prison and volunteer and help us along the way. And it's, it's great to have people believe in your future and give you a second chance. And I just wanna say thank you to all the volunteers that go into prisons around the state and help men and women and help them transform their lives. You know, a lot of people don't know how many people volunteer to come in and it's subjected to, to, to harsh treatment by the guards when they get there, but they still come in week after week and help us out. And I just wanna say thank you to all the volunteers, all the lawyers that I had over the years and, and the people on this panel, because this is the type of work that will actually um, help change the system and make the public aware of what's going on within the system. Again, thank you all. Thank you, thank you. Jared, I think you 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 read queued up. Yeah, um, and I'll I'll be pretty brief because uh, I, I think everyone um, has said it um, much better than I ever could. Uh, but something that I, I really do think that people need to be aware of um, and really to think about um, is just that the police are not infallible. Um, it, it's I think again like the trial penalty is the way that it currently is because people assume that if a police officer is saying that this person is guilty, then it is okay to punish that person as much as possible. Um, you know, I became a public defender in 2014, uh, the year that the NYPD killed Eric Garner. Um, and six years later, despite video after video of, of seeing them brutalize black and brown communities, their budget has gone from about $4.6 billion to just under $6 billion. Um, you know, police have been uh, the second or third uh, most respected uh, profession in this country for such a long time. Uh, police can do just about whatever um, they want to communities and between cop unions, uh, between uh, institutional police forces, they are able to fight back against almost any measure of, of accountability uh, for them. So I think if we really do want to restructure what the criminal legal system looks like, um, and if we really do want uh, to, to introduce some equity into what the trial process looks like, we have to, I think that starts with recognizing that police are not infallible, they often make mistakes, and they often don't make mistakes, but they just do like really pernicious things on purpose. Um, police are the people that took, you know, their freedom away from from people here, um, from the Central Park Five. Um, just There's just so many different instances of police just making really horrific mistakes. And I think that if we remember that people's entry point into the criminal legal system is from this force that has quite frankly, always been on the side of oppression from the inception of modern American policing when they basically you know, chased down runaway slaves to um, attacking people with dogs and fire hoses when they were fighting for black liberation uh, to it's pride month uh, to the Stonewall rebellion uh, to what we're seeing them do to protesters in the street now. Um, the criminal legal system is inherently flawed because the way that people enter it uh, is through policing. And until we change that, um, and until people are really recognizing that that is a problem, um, our people need to recognize that that is a problem for us to have the bigger structural changes that we really need. Absolutely, and just like uh, videotape allowed us to see that brutality uh, in a way that people didn't um, in years past. Uh, so I believe uh, if we could bring some, some uh, 
some sunlight and transparency into the whole criminal justice process so that these things could be litigated from start to finish and expose some of this through, through the process. Uh, it would be, that's what, the, that's what the, these fundamental rights are all about. Uh, last word to you, Susan. I would just like to follow up a little bit on um, Robert's experience and also from a criminal defense lawyer's perspective. Um, you touched on this a little bit, Norman, about how um, difficult it is as a defense lawyer who feels like the, um, the, the last line between liberty um, and mass incarceration uh, and sitting down sometimes and talking to somebody who is either by choice or by assignment, put their life and their future in their hands is a daunting uh, responsibility. And that most of us that take that responsibility on as a career choice, take it quite seriously. Uh, and sitting down to tell somebody, yes, you have a viable, triable case, you might win. But if you lose, you may get 20 or 25 years and you only live 20 is a very difficult conversation to have. Uh, and it takes its toll on everybody in the system. Uh, and sometimes that can really damage an attorney-client relationship when you want to be the person that guides uh, someone that's in their darkest hour that's been accused of something. Um, and you're faced with these daunting penalties, um, a, a judge maybe with their fingers in their ears, and a very inexperienced, most of the time, young person with enormous charge and power and very little sense of what's valuable in, uh, in life uh, and very little experience in life. Uh, and that from a defense lawyer's perspective can be overwhelming. On a more happy note, I would like to say that I am encouraged and thrilled and awed and humbled by people like Robert, uh, and some of the people that I represented on clemency petition who were serving life sentences, life with no hope of getting out, and got up every day and learned, read, studied, better, bettered themselves, and did more with their lives incarcerated than so many people do on the outside. That to me gives me hope in our society and in humankind. And I'm so grateful that there are people like Robert in the world and that some of my clients that got clemency exist. Um, and hats off to you for your perseverance and setting this, setting a role model for us to do more of what we have on the outside. Well, I wanna thank all of you. What a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, panel. Uh, the passion, uh, the desire to pursue justice, um, and um, uh, the dedication that you bring to your work and uh, to this issue uh, is really humbling. Uh, you are all uh, genuine heroes. Uh, and uh, I hope that uh, the viewers uh, will come away from this and from the film, uh, The Vanishing Trial, with a new sense of one, one of the uh, tremendous problems that we need to fix, get rid of, start over, uh, what have you. Um, we'll do it. Uh, like I said at the beginning, one of the things that I'm, uh, well, there are a lot of reasons for some encouragement, uh, even in dark times and um, the, uh, the uh, massive protests, the new awareness, uh, and the, the, the cross ideological excitement behind trying to do something is, uh, is a reason for some hope. So let's leave it on that note. Uh, Jessica, if you want to just put that last, that slide up again. So anybody who wants to go to those links can find them. And again, we will be making publicly available uh, the film in a few short weeks. So thank you all very much for participating uh, and have a great night. Thank you.